or something. Greetings, chess players, and welcome back to the free winter break chess club. As promised, we have Tatev Abrahamian with us again. And also, as promised, instead of uh, me asking her some questions, um, this week the questions all came from you guys. But before we get to those uh, questions, um, I wanted to make sure that we give Tatev two opportunities, one, at least two, one at the beginning, one at the end, to tell uh, the wonderful campers uh, how they can get uh, lessons with you, sign up for classes, see you on Twitch, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, <clears throat> well, sorry, <laughs> great, great start. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you're coming back, and those of you who are just joining, welcome. I hope those of you who are joining back, you enjoyed the lesson last time. Uh, so the, um, so I work for a chess academy and we offer weekly online online classes for every level. We have a five under 500, and 1,000, under 1,500 in an advanced group. So we have kids of all levels. Um, our academy is called achessacademy.org or you can email americanchessacademy at gmail.com and uh, I, we will tell you the information. Uh, so starting... Wednesday will be our last class for the year, and then we'll have a break for the rest uh, until the end of the week. And then starting Monday, our new session will begin in the new year, and our classes will resume. So hopefully some of you will be able to um, join us and, or join back. And uh, my Twitch is... Um, I can just put a link here. It's Twitch, TV, Tatev, underscore A. So I also have some streams. Um, if you're joining late, you know, that uh, might be more uh, not, not a kid-friendly content. <laughs> but I try to keep it that way. So you guys are free to follow me there. I have also have some uh, videos on chess.com on YouTube, on St. Louis Chess Club's channel. On uh, chess.com I have several video series. I have one of my favorite, which is... Um, going uh, through my favorite chess studies, and that's something I love. So you guys are welcome to also check out the other content that I have. But do sign up for our classes. I think those are really fun. Uh, there are long. I have one, like, in a couple of hours, and uh, I hope to see you guys there. Super. Um, so, yeah, please do. Uh, you know, if, if you find uh, Tatev inspiring, and you should... Um, please, please check out her uh, her classes because uh, I have been to the uh, American Chess Academy um, in Glendale, and uh, it was just one of my favorite favorite parts of my last trip to Southern California. And uh, I mean, to to say that, let's let's put it in perspective. I went to Disneyland on the same day, but I had I had more fun at the uh, at the Chess Academy. So uh, yeah, please please check it out. Okay, Tatev, go ahead uh, with some of those questions from the uh, students. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of questions here, and there are some basic ones that people ask me, so I'll just answer them, like when I learned how to play chess and how did I get in chess. So I, there are a few of them, so I don't think I need to answer individually or say who, the, uh, who, the, um, who asked those questions. Uh, so I learned chess when I was eight years old. Uh, I kind of learned chess accidentally in some way. I was with my dad at his workplace and he was cleaning out his desk and he had a chess set. So I asked him to teach me how to play and he promised he would teach me. And the way he taught me how to play chess is he had me watch him play with his friends, which is how I learned. And uh, I grew up in um, Armen in Yerevan, Armenia. And uh, those of you who are familiar with Armenia, you know, like chess is very big there. That was very easy for me to get into, and I had a coach from the beginning, and you know, chess always became a serious thing for me, and that's how I got into chess. Um, so let me go through some other questions. Uh, okay, there's a lot of them. So when did you start playing chess? I became a double gym. I want to say in 2011. I'm not sure. I had the norms for a while, but you know, there's a process you have to do, you have to apply, and everything. And I think that happened in 2011. Um, my video feels a little blurry. Is it just me? Uh, 
Yeah, the uh, the feed from your camera is a little blurry. We cannot see your penguins. No, I blurred my okay. okay there I we go. Unblurred my background. Is it better? Mm hmm Okay. Uh, so those are some general questions that I got asked. Um, so one question that I got that uh, um, well, I thought was a very specific and a good question from Johannes Chow is when calculating sacrifices, what should my thought processes be? So that's a great question. Uh, so when you, so one of the things you want to do when you're calculating sacrifices is um, you want to keep track of uh, the pieces. So you don't want to, uh, you know, like sacrifice all your pieces and then you basically end up with nothing left. So what you want to do is you want to keep track of the material. So I, I think that's something that's very important to do. And uh, it's also very just in general when you're calculating sacrifices and every, uh, everything it's very important for you to pause and make sure you are considering options so you're not your thinking doesn't become too linear like if you're capturing you don't automatically think your opponent's going to recapture and vice versa so you want to keep an open mind because um, unless the line is super forcing you know it's like check and has to be captured or something super forcing you do want to make sure you're keeping an open mind. And one thing I always recommend and one thing I always do is um, when, like, I, I feel like I'm about to play a winning line that, like, the game is about to end. Whoa. Did I? No. Uh, what I like to do is I like to take my time and make sure I calculate, like, I go, basically go through every legal move that is in the position just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Because it's better to take like five, ten extra minutes in your calculation and make sure you're correct and rush through it and mess it up and then you're starting the game all over. Uh, so, but the main thing too is to keep, when you're sacrificing, is to keep track of the material and do keep in mind when you give up a lot, your opponent can give some of it back as defense. So if you give up a queen from the beginning, your opponent might give the queen for a bishop and then still be up a piece and that's going to be tough for you. Uh, okay, let me go through. So there's a question, is the Queen's Gambit decline better than the Slav defense, or the other way around, like that is a matter of taste. And Asher Toman asked me if attaining the title of Grandmaster in the Open League, one of your goals. Yes, I, I do. Uh, I have all my um, international master norms. Uh, I just haven't crossed 2400 feet there. So there were some questions about what requirements there are to getting a title. Um, so, you know, we have separate titles for women and open titles that everyone can get them. So for me, to get a title, um, you have to play in a series in several tournaments and the requirements you have to, to meet. So if you get you need to get a norm and to get a norm, you have to perform at a certain rating. You have to play a certain number of foreigners. So you cannot just organize a tournament with your friends and then beat your friends and get a norm. Like you want to they want you to play like foreigners. So, you know, it's um like an inter international event, so it's not um, so again, <laughs> so it's not like you organizing an event with your friends, and <clears throat> you have to perform uh, at a certain rating, and the tournament has to have at least nine rounds, so it cannot be like a small weekend five round tournament. So those are pretty rigorous requirements to get those titles. So for international master, I have all my norms, and I need to have my international rating to cross 2400, and I've come very close several times. It just hasn't happened yet. Um, so there are several people who ask me what is the best way to train for a tournament. Uh, I do think tactics are a good way to train for a tournament. I think solving a lot is good because you want your mind to be sharp. Uh, one thing that I've noticed for myself, which may not be true for everyone, when I've solved too much before a tournament, my mind starts thinking in a very forcing way. Then every time I get a position in a tournament, I feel like I need to solve it. So I, I, so I also feel like before a tournament, it's a good idea to just look through games. So you're thinking of chess more of a broad game. So you're not just trying to solve every position. Uh, so I think that's a good thing. But I do think that solving a lot is good because <coughs> your mind does need to be sharp for a tournament. Okay, let's see what is there. Uh, so Ian... Manandhar asked me several questions. So yeah, ask, answer who is your favorite chess player. My favorite chess player is Judith Holger. Uh, she's always been an inspiration to me. Uh, she's the greatest female chess player and um, she's just amazing. And I've always looked up to her and I still do. 
And what is your um, what is your favorite opening? Mm. My favorite opening is the French Defense. I've been playing it for a long time. <clears throat> and it's actually funny. I scrolled up and there's a question from Sebastian Wang that says, "What is which is better in the French? Take, advance, or ignore the deep pawn? So do not ignore your deep pawn. Do not give up your pawn. Uh, taking, I mean, it's again a matter of taste. You can defend the pawn, you can trade. There's a lot of options that you can have. All right. Um, there's a, several questions about what um, chess books I recommend. Again, from many people, and um, uh, so it depends on the level. One series of books that I really like called um, Oh my God, uh, it's Chess School. Let me let me find this. And I am marking all the uh, questions that uh, Tatev is answering so we can get uh, the um, questions, the uh, people that submitted them, their points for the okay. point titles. So the seri oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the series of book that I like is called The Manu Manual of Chess Combinations by Sergei Iv Ivashchenko. So it starts with 1A, 1B, uh, then goes to CA and or no, I think it's 1A, 1B, and then B. B or C. Anyway, this is like four series, I think. I have three of them. So it starts very basic. It starts with like capturing or like checkmate in one, and then it goes until checkmate in four, and then becomes actually very, very difficult. So those, book I really, those books I really like a lot. I think that's very helpful. Uh, I like the book, The Thousand and One Exercises, um, or Thousand and One, uh, what is it called? Thousand and One Exercises for... Yeah, I don't have my bookshelf behind me. <laughs> well, I, you know, I had never heard of the uh, Manual of Chess Combination, so I'm going to have to get that in my collection. Yeah, it's a good one. It's um, a thousand and one chess exercises for beginners, and there's a thousand and one chess exercises for club players. So a lot of people like ask me this. They're like, you know, I do tactics in, um, like online or something, and you know, like doing tactics is great, but uh, and like ex solving exercises online, and there's a lot of tools. But I think, uh, you know, like books do offer you a methodology of how to solve, so you're not all over the place. You know, they have patterns, they have um, like they teach you a tactic or they teach you a concept, and then they give you exercises so you keep practicing, so you're not just kind of all over the place. Like, you know, when I solve on chess.com, yeah, they have good puzzles, but then the ver it varies so much, which in a way it's good because when you're playing chess, you don't know what you're going to get. You can get all kinds of tactics, but especially if you're newer to chess, it can be <clears throat> a bit overwhelming. So it's good to practice the same thing over and over. And the steps method, uh, the steps book, if you guys have heard of it, those are pretty good too. I have also been using them when teaching. And as you get stronger, I really recommend Dvoretsky's books and Yusupov's books. Those are the books I grew up on, and those books are classic, so they're just never going to go out of style. How old were you when you were going through uh, Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual? Um, the Endgame Manual? Uh, it's not that old, right? Um, it's... that's true, huh? That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's that's very no, but heavy like those reading. classical yeah. books. Yeah. I was going through when I was like nine. Wow. And, well, we started with Yusupov. Yusupov is a little easier. Yusupov is like an introduction to Dvoretsky. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, and what what you said about the uh, combinations being in themes, um, I I think that's uh, especially helpful for uh, newer chess players because it helps you. Um, it helps you compile the information that you're practicing um, in, in, in your brain. It, it helps you uh, connect what the, uh, what the theme is versus, as uh, Tatev was talking about, um, doing, you know, do, doing random combinations is good, but uh, the, those books that put them in a, uh, a collection based on theme can be uh, v very, very useful for learning purposes. Yeah, because when you're just learning, and this is something like I didn't really realize until I started um, teaching and I started seeing like streams of um, like new, like um, 
you know, like the pog champs, like the stronger player teaching new players, and I'm realizing, wow, it's so overwhelming for a new beginner player to see the board. Like, for us, we look at the board, we see the entire board, but for a new player, like, to see the board as one is just so overwhelming and see how one piece is attacking all the way to the other side of the board and, like, the backwards moves. So that's why I do think that um, studying, like, getting a book where it teaches you a tactic and then practicing over and over until you get in, like, seeing in different variations is good. But I think if you're a more experienced player, like, um, unless you have a very specific weakness that you're constantly working on or you're specifically working on for a tournament, like, before a tournament, it is good to do a variety. Because, again, when you're playing in a tournament, no one is there to be like, ah, it's time to look for a tactic. So your brain has to be wired to constantly be looking for certain tactics, you know, certain patterns. So I think before a tournament, the variety is good. But I do I also like doing, uh, and uh, it's been suggested to me to do, end, like, pawn end games because it's just pure calculation. Okay. Um, so there's a question from Sabrina. Um... What do you recommend using for strong players to continue progressing to... Hold on. What do you recommend using for strong players to continue pro progressing? Okay, so it's basically asking how what uh, for strong players to continue progressing. Um, I don't think it's that different. I think it's just uh, you're doing different level of work because uh, you still need to know your end game. You still need to be tactically sharp. I think being tactically, tactically sharp is so important. Like, not to make one move blunders in any level. Like, we see everyone blunders. We, like, a few days ago, I saw Magn Aronian blundered. Magnus didn't see it. So, like, this happens to everyone. So, we want to eliminate or control the number of these blunders. So, you always want to be tactically sharp. You want to know your basic end games. And the stronger you get, it's still, you know, like, same concept, but... Um, more sophisticated, right? Like, if I'm studying, me studying an opening is different than Magnus studying an opening, but we both study our openings and we both try to be prepared. And, yeah, the chess books, a lot of people ask me, again, like, Yusupov is Dvoretsky's, like, best student, and their books, if you're starting, are, I think they start at, like, maybe 13, 1400 level and then goes up to master and beyond. And then if you're way, way stronger, which I don't think anyone is here, then, like, I do recommend Agard books, but everyone does. Um, and, uh -huh. you know, uh, following up on Sabrina's question, um, what, what do you recommend if you get stuck at a certain level? What, what do you recommend changing maybe in your, uh, study habits? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough one because, um, it's kind of hard to identify why you get stuck. I've definitely gotten stuck in my uh, studies. Uh, I mean, one thing I do recommend is having a coach. I understand this is not really um, something that everyone can do, but I think a coach can really guide you. Uh, so when you get stuck, you do want to like go back through your games and see, try to narrow it down, like where do you get stuck? So it's probably something in your thinking process. So when you go through your games and see, uh, is this like a sp like a um, very common mistake you have? Is it something maybe psychological? So you, the only way you can improve at chess if you're like 100% honest with yourself. You know, you have to identify the excuses you make for yourself. Like, be honest, like, why are you always in time trouble? You know, like, why why do you blunder? You have to be... And that's a difficult thing to do, you know, it's easier to make excuses, but you do have to be very honest with yourself. Like, are you in time trouble because, you know, you get distracted a lot during the game? Or it's just an excuse for you because, you know, if you blunder in time trouble, then it's an easy excuse to make. So, uh, but, the, you know, it does involve looking at your game and some uh, self-reflection. I mean, I think it's hard to make a very gen general um, advice on, like, do this and then you'll, you'll get unstuck. But I do think, like, narrowing down what is it that's going wrong for you is very helpful. Well, I think that was great advice. Um, you know, fi finding a, uh, a great coach such as yourself to uh, help. help. Um, and then the other thing um, that I've never heard uh, stated before is... Uh, you cannot improve at chess unless you're 100 percent honest with yourself that is a a, a powerful statement I, I really like that i'm going to be using that yeah in i think classes. that's true about everything right yeah. you have to be um it's so much easier to make like 
when you look at your game, it's so much easier to be like, oh, I blundered, oh, I didn't see this, and then, but like, why didn't you see it? And then be like, oh, because I wasn't thinking this, but why weren't you thinking this? Because, you know, like, maybe there's um, some kind of narrow thinking in your head, or it's just like a pattern you don't see, or like, I was in time trouble, like, why did you find yourself in time trouble? Like, those those questions are the difficult ones, because like, just saying, or checking with a computer, and computer spits out a line, and you're like, oh, how could I not see it? So, because, you know, it's impossible to see, so maybe the mistakes you make are reasonable, and it's just fine. Uh, okay, so who have you been in a World Women Championship? Actually, I have been twice and I got knocked out in the first round. I played Alexandra Kostinuk and Harika Dronawal and I lost to both of them in the first round. Who's the hardest player you have ever played? Oh, I played Hikaru Nakamura once and Wesley So actually, and I okay, I lost to both of them. Uh, there's a question by Eden. I do pretty well in the opening, but in the middle game, my structure tends to fall apart. Sometimes I come back in the end game, and sometimes I don't. Well, what are your tips on how to stay strong and well-developed? Uh, so that sounds like you memorize your openings, and you just split out, like, whatever moves you know, and you don't really n know the ideas in your openings. So I would suggest, like, looking to more games in your the openings you play in, and try to understand some ideas, like, try to Really spend some time and I understand why the pieces go where they go. Don't just play chess without, um, like, intention. Like, don't play your opening without uh, any... Like, don't develop your pieces without an intention. Like, know where your pieces are going and why they're going there. Like, you don't play e4, knight f3 or whatnot for, like, no reason, right? There's a reason why we play those moves. So that's uh, tedious work. Um, middle game is, of course, the most difficult part of the game because... Um, you know, we have so many books on the opening, so many resources, and some of the end games, but the middle game is the most difficult part. So many ideas, so many pieces on the board. You play your openings, and now you're on, on your own. Um, I, I think of myself as a good middle game player because that's the part of the game I do really enjoy. Uh, but yeah, again, like looking at games and trying on your own to really make the effort to figure out like why the pieces go where they go. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I answer. I mean, some of the questions are similar, mm -hmm. so I, I just gave them. Um, yeah, they they, well, they did not see each other's questions, so um, some of you asked very similar questions, and if you asked a similar question, I will also give you uh, points. Yeah. Okay. So, like a lot of play, play, uh, a lot of uh, kids ask me like, when did I learn chess? So I've been, I, or like, what inspired me? So I kind of gave a generic answer to cover all of it. Uh, so someone asked me, I did. He asked me, how do I study openings the right way? So you know, like looking at games and like make an effort to understand why a piece goes somewhere. And. Okay, so Landon has a lot of questions. So what sort of training do you recommend for players who struggle with end games? Um, so I would recommend learning your basics. So one thing you have to know is like the complete like theoretical end games, like this king and pawn end game, king and rook end games. You want to like narrow them, get to a point where you just you know, it's like a nature. You can always draw those king and pawn end games. You can always win the winning ones, those rook, basic rook end games. There is a book, 100 uh, End Games You Must Know. It's a very nice one. It starts like super basic and then progressively gets stronger. And actually on chess.com, if you go, uh, you probably won't see it if I do it, but um, if you go to puzzles, there is drills. Mm -hmm. So let's see if it's show up. And you can go to End Game Find Fundamentals, and there are some basic end games that you can just practice. And you want to do that until. Um, um, can you guys see Yeah, it? We, we can see it. Okay, my feet, I guess, is a little behind. That's why I don't see it. Okay, yeah. So, end game fundamentals, and then you can practice, and you want to just do them. There's, like, there's king and knight, or two bishop, uh, not king and knight, bishop and knight, or two bishop checkmates. So, you want to practice them until, you know, you know them really well. And, um, like, when people say I'm bad at end games, that's, that's such a broad thing. Because it's like, why, why are you bad at end games? Did you not study? Maybe you didn't learn them the proper way. But there, is, there are certain basic end games that you must know. 
And another question is, what chess books do you recommend for players ready 12 and up? Like the... What is it? The... The Manual of Chess Combination, I think for you would be 1B. I think the second one... Second one should already be good, maybe the third one actually. Let me see if I can... Mm, so it's 1A, 1B, yeah, I think the second one should already be good. And... Ooh, I fun, fun fell asleep. And I'm going to be picking up that uh, complete, uh, complete uh, manual myself, because like I said, I do not have that in my library. And if Tatev recommends it, it must be good. What world champions should players who want to learn endgame study? Definitely Magnus Carlsen. Mm -hmm. But Magnus Carlsen is on a higher level. Magnus Carlsen is an amazing endgame player. Like today, he played an, he won an endgame of 3 versus 3 rook endgame. The guy just plays out any position. He is absolutely amazing. Um, and But again, this is a higher level. It sounds like you're not quite there yet, so I would recommend just studying your basics first. And is getting a slightly higher rated player as a mentor a good idea? Uh, like, I think if you're at the 1200 level, like, the rating of your mentor is not as important as their experience and, like, their ability to really identify your weaknesses. Um... Uh, Okay, like general questions, how to prepare for big tournaments, like, you know, a lot of tactics is a good idea, or reviewing your openings also. Uh, which chess game is your favorite? Ooh, good question. And which chess game is favorite of your own? I think the game I showed last time is my favorite game of mine. Uh, it's just such a pretty game, but my absolute favorite game... Uh, I don't think I can narrow it down to one. Maybe three. Uh, I don't think I can narrow it down to three either. <laughs> so many, so many great games of chess. Yeah, I mean there are games, you know, like some game I looked at today, and I was like, wow, this game is amazing. So I think it's just so hard to narrow it down to something. Uh, so what do you practice to get better at chess daily? Like tactics again, like tactics, sharp, being sharp, seeing tactics, and most important thing about tactics is being open to seeing tactics like you have to constantly look for them not wait for someone to tell you but even the tactics in the position may not work but you constantly have to look for them um my favorite chess book so i recommended the books for you guys mm -hmm. um so how do you prepare do you find it hard to be a woman in chess mm -hmm. so by isabella um, did you find it hard to be a woman in chess? I think there are pluses and minuses. I think um, it's not like, you know, all horrible, like every day is misery and suffering. I think there are some benefits to being women in chess. I think there are certain opportunities you do get that um, more likely to get or some opportunities that are more open to you because you're a woman. So, I mean, there's also that side. I cannot just completely ignore that. I mean, of course, there's downsides. Um, that, um, you know, it's like the comments that I get that my male counterparts, counterparts would never get. Uh, but uh, I, um, I mean, it's give or, it's, you know, it has its pluses, it ha has its minuses. For me, it's been mostly fine, so I don't, um, I don't find it um, to be that difficult to be a woman in chess. I know there's, I mean, okay, every woman in chess or in a male-dominated field has had some unpleasant experiences, but I think overall it's still worth doing. Mm -hmm. How did you know that you loved the game of chess? Um, I don't know, <laughs> I just did. Uh, it's, you know, it's something I've been doing for so long and uh, it's just something that I always come back to, I guess that's how I know. Even if I, you know, like this year I haven't played any chess, but next year hopefully when we play start playing chess, I will definitely, um, definitely looking forward to it. Uh, and how does it feel to be such an inspiration to so many players? I don't really think of myself that way. So it's really every time someone tells me that, I get surprised. Uh, 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 I think. Did anybody ever underestimate your ability to play chess because you're a woman? Yeah, people people definitely do that. But it feels really good to beat them. I mean, people will always dismiss you, right? Like, oh, I couldn't play against a girl, or a girl, I didn't think a girl could be this good. 
Uh, but you know, we have to try to to move forward. And you know, if you're a guy and you hear someone, another guy saying this kind of things, we have to call them out. And it's not cannot just be girls trying to stand up for ourselves. It has to be other guys who tell guys who think like this and say negative things to girls and try to put girls down. Then this is not okay. And uh, this is just not an okay way to talk to a girl and put someone down like that. Yeah. If if you you know happen to see chess, chess is a a big community and it's a uh, it's a big tent, and right now we're getting so much more interest because of the uh, the uh, Magnus events that he um, hosted himself online this last year, and the uh, show on uh, Netflix, The Queen's Gambit. Um, and if you see, you know, as a as a chess player, if you see somebody being disrespectful or discouraging to another person who's interested in chess or or a chess player, um, you know, stand up, stand up against that, because uh, ch chess is a a big tent. There's there's definitely you know um, space for for everybody to be involved. I think uh, Chess.com just had uh, celebrated their uh, 50 millionth um, subscriber the other day. Yeah, yeah it, I mean it's it's a huge tent. It's it's international. It's beyond genders. It's beyond races. Um, so yeah, stand stand up against bullying. Yeah, because I think when we talk about um, promoting chess to girls, and yeah, chess, girls make up I think or should get girls and women like twenty percent of um, all chess players. I, I think a lot we talk about like how to encourage girls and like make girls only classes and like girls only tournament to get more interest but I think we don't focus enough or how to eliminate like bad behavior and things that discourage girls from mm -hmm. playing uh, so I think a lot of the burden like falls on the girls and not like on the guys who maybe you know don't behave well or say things or do things that really discourage girls so I, I think um, like men guys should also take big responsibility in making sure that girls play chess and like, I'm not saying, like, give extra treatment or something, but if you hear a guy says, like, oh, I can't believe I lost to a girl, then, you know, you can just be like, what is the big deal? Like, aren't we all playing the same game? And then that kind of makes them, um, you know, look silly. And if you don't, like, you're not a confrontational person, not a lot of people are. If your friend is saying like that, uh, like, one way you can do it is just ask them, like, why not? Like, it's not a very, you know, it's not like... Um, like it's not confrontational. It's not like you're gonna get into a fight. You're just asking a question like, why? Like why are supplies you lost to a girl? And then they make a comment, and you just keep asking why, and then eventually they run out of answers, and hopefully they realize like what they're saying is kind of ridiculous. That that's a, a wonderful suggestion, actually. Um, yeah, if if you just you know if if somebody's showing um, unjustifiable bias in their in their comments, um, you don't have to be confrontational. You can let you can just ask them politely to explain what they mean and in that way you're allowing them to keep the microphone and um yeah if if it's unjustifiable bias then uh, then they aren't going to be able to uh answer answer for for that and uh, we'll you know that that'll shut them up for sure yeah and as i was saying right it's it's another an excuse like you're like when people say oh i just can play against girls like that's a ridiculous thing to say what do you mean you cannot play against girls so you cannot play against a can play a board game against half of the population so i think if yeah if you like keep asking them like <laughs> what like why not why not then you know hopefully they come to a conclusion that it's ridiculous and it's not just chess you know it's in any field and any like it's a race or gender or anything like that it's just completely ridiculous if you just like keep asking people like to explain themselves they just can't because there's just no logical reasoning behind it and it's not a very again it's like it doesn't put you in a position where you are because you know when you confront someone they get defensive no matter how bad their arguments are because they feel attacked so if you're kind of approaching them in a more open way and it sounds you know you're just asking a question you're just open to it uh, some people can really um, come around and hopefully understand their great outcomes. great suggestions In their um, and uh, uh, does some of you know some of that uh, um, stem from your uh, studies you you majored in psychology right 
Uh, no, actually, this is a suggestion that I heard from somewhere, and I just think it's just such a good uh-huh. idea. I actually also had a, a conversation with someone, and like they're making some claims, and uh, and then uh, I thought they were. Um, I think it was like a political talk, and I was like, really, like, did this really happen? And then they kind of started things like, oh, maybe I should like read more about mm-hmm. it or something. So I, I do think when you know you hear something that's like very out there and very radical, or it just doesn't make sense if you just question that person and ask them to explain themselves. I mean, sometimes people are just so in their beliefs that there's, I mean, it feels like there's nothing you can do. But I think in this kind of way, like giving people room to explain themselves or like change their mind instead of just being like, oh, you're wrong, which is a natural reaction for so many of us. Uh, I think it's helpful. I mean, I cannot say that I always do this. Sometimes, you know, when um, something triggers me, I also can get very confrontational, but I think like this uh, is a better approach. Seems like a a solid uh, suggestion for sure. Um, so what uh, what did you have for us today? I see that there's a uh, chess position up on the screen. Yeah, so someone uh, uh, so last time I showed a game of mine uh-huh. and like some again like someone asked me today like what is your favorite game and today I saw this game and I thought this game was just amazing so I wanted to share it to you with you and this game actually happened today. There's a Magnus Carlsen tournament going on. Uh, somehow there's a lot of chess going on these days. Uh, so this is, uh, it starts like around Robin and then it goes into eight players and then it's mini matches until there's two left. So this is quarterfinals. This is Levan Aronian versus Hikaru Nakamura. And uh, Levan Aronian is one of my favorite players. You know, he we both come from the second, same country. So it's a name that I always heard and, you know, brings me a lot of pride that he's such a great player. And he's also an amazing, very creative player. So I really, really enjoy his games. Um... So let's start with this position. So this is uh, going to be white to move. So I think a lot of you suggested the move for white. And actually with the last move, ah, ah, you cannot see the moves, right? I cannot see the moves, no. Um, Who who is uh, black in this game? Uh, Oh, Hikaru. So I think the way you cropped it is Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to double check. Yeah, so Levon is playing white, Hikaru is playing black, two amazing players. So a lot of you guys are right, so rook g6 was played. You cannot move. Uh, so here, black took with the queen because if you take with the rook, and there is a big problem because the queen is not defended. Wow. And if you take with the rook, and I take, and the queen goes here, I mean the king goes there, then I mean okay, your position is just starting to fall apart. And one thing I wanted to note about this position is. Um, Something I talk in my classes about opposite color bishops and how great they are for attacking. Because if you look at the position and if you look at this bishop, there is no piece to counter it. It's just, you know, uh, covering this whole diagonal. And if I look at this bishop on d3, it's a very pretty looking piece because, you know, it's um, on a great square. It's in your opponent's camp. It's defended by a pawn, so it's an outpost, but it's also out of the game. And the bishop... um, cannot really join the game. So if I were black, I would love to somehow magically put my bishop on g4 to defend my king side. And, you know, sometimes we have, this happens in chess, like we move or we make a lot of effort to move a piece to a square and it looks like a great square and it looks like we improved the piece, but it's just visual. Like, it's just on a great square, it looks very pretty, but it's just not doing anything. And this is what I meant when I was saying, you know, you want to move your pieces with intention. Okay, obviously sometimes we make mistakes. This bishop came here f- uh, from some time ago. It's not like it came here, but like the bishop cannot leave, and it's also not really assisting this king. So actually, uh, what Hikaru did, uh, he should have played something like queen f7. So now uh, this tactic doesn't quite work out. Oops. Because now I block, and now my queen is defended. And, you know, put up a better resistance. But instead he played queen d1, uh, rook d7. So queen takes. Levon uh, runs away from any kind of uh, second rank checks in the future if the bishop moves. So he improves his king. And this is something that good players are, um, you know, they're like just so masterful at this. They very good at improving their pieces, they're very good at looking at a piece and being like, ah, this piece would be better on that square, or oh, my king is going to be 
weak in the future, so let me improve my king before I do anything. So, like, these great players, like, they look at the position immediately, they see these things. Okay, and now queen a, uh, rook b7. And uh, now white to move, and I want to see what you guys can come up with. And Tatev, you can see their chat, correct? Yeah. Excellent. So go ahead, go ahead and type in your suggestions. Tatev's watching. So remember what I said about um, improving your pieces. So, uh, so last time we were talking about chess imbalances, right? Like I showed my game. I had a uh, queen against three pieces. So now Levon has a queen versus two rooks. Two rooks generally are better than a queen. There's two of them. They can work together. But remember what is the thing that I said, the number one thing, that uh, king's weakness. If there is a weak king on the board, then a queen is just uh, a killer piece because a queen is just so good at attacking a king. And if we look at the king, there is a... A vulnerable king on the board. And there is um, just a slight uh, delay, uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, 10 seconds between uh, our conversation and what the uh, what the students are hearing. Um, but they're they're typing in their responses right now. Thanks for bringing such a fresh game, Tatev. This is a this is neat. I ha I haven't seen this game yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I really like using um, current games in my um, in my um, lessons, especially the top level games. And there's just so much creativity in these games, and just so many great ideas. I, I think we're in a a golden age of chess right now. You know, people people talk about. Um, you know, maybe the Romantic era, uh, you know, or, or maybe the um, Cold War era, um, you know, with being, being you know, the, the best time after the Fisher boom in, in our country. But I, I honestly believe we're just in a, a, a golden age of chess right now. Tomorrow we're going to have uh, Rochelle Wu as a, as a guest. And uh, I was just blown away by um, the game she played against Thalia Cervantes. I think it was from 2019. I was just going through that uh, game, and it's it's just amazing how many how many great games um, that are are being played every day. By yeah, and the access that we mm -hmm. have. Like all these players who are streaming, like you can sit there and listen to Hikaru and how Hikaru analyzes or this banter blitzes and everything. Those just access we have to top players. Yeah, it's it's never been like this, certainly uh, in my lifetime. Did they have uh, chess on TV in Armenia? Did they? Yeah, we have this um, program. Uh, I think it was called Chess 64 or something. So it was like a 10 minute recap program that uh, they're telling like what happened in chess that week or that they are weak i mean okay like you cannot compare it to what it is now mm -hmm. right there's just uh like the technology has improved so much yeah yeah i mean uh, there, there's so many different uh youtube channels and and twitch streams and you know lessons all, all over the place it's yeah so i think the key is to weed out because there's also like anyone can get online and have a program mm -hmm. or something, right? So you want to make sure you're, you're picking out um, the correct one. Because sometimes my students are like, oh, I saw it on YouTube. And I was like, like, whose video? Like, where did you find mm -hmm. this? They'll play something. I'm like, where did you see this? And they'll be like, oh, I saw a YouTube video. All right. All right. So a lot of you are suggesting Queen E1 on Queen A1. He did play Queen A1, which is why I'm showing you this, because I think this is just such a great move. Like, I just love this kind of moves. So yeah, his idea is to bring his queen into the game, and also, obviously, you want your bishop and the queen to be switched. But you also always have ideas like bishop h8, maybe bishop f6, bishop g5, and just for your queen to come in. And again, we have opposite color bishops, which in the end game are very well known for being drives, but it's we still have queen and rooks on the board, so there's still a lot of attacking chances. And once I come and start checking you on the dark squares, or, you know, I'm, I am... Uh, attacking your dark squares, your light square bishop is just completely useless here. It's just a pretty looking piece. So Hikaru takes. And 
Twenty seven and he played uh, okay, we're threatening all kinds of mates. So he played uh, rook b8 and just resigned. I think he just realized he's losing because I, I can just check you. You have to go back. I can check you. And I can play something like bishop f6, bishop g5, and you're just getting mated here. And and again, bishop kind of came into the play, but I'm attacking on the dark squares, and your light square bishop is just absolutely useless here. Okay, so there's another game I wanted you to show. This one I have to copy paste. One sec. Boom. Boom. That, that was really neat. I, I enjoyed the uh, Queen A1 because I was thinking Queen E1 myself because Queen A1 is behind the bishop um, rather yeah. than rather than in front of it. But uh, yeah, that, that was really, really educational. This was a great game. I, I also really like that because Queen A1 is a very difficult move to come up with. Okay, so this is the game between, uh, so this is from 2006 Chess Olympiad, uh, and this is the year that Armenia won this Olympiad, and then it went on to win two more times in 2008, 2006 in Turin, Italy, 2008 in Dresden, uh, Germany, and 2012 in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, so Armenia, if we look at the ranking, rankings, it's not the number one team, you know, it's Russia and China and now the US too also. But they've won the Olympia three times, which is a very difficult task. And, you know, they just have great team, team spirit. And somehow their players always play better in team tournaments than in individual tournaments. They just overperform. And they also have Levon Arunian, which is um, very helpful. So the Olympiad has come, become more competitive now. Those of you who don't know what the Olympiad is, it's a team tournament, one of the very few ones in the world. Uh, so every team has four players and... Um, Alter, um, yeah, alternate, you know, if someone gets sick or something, and you play like white, black, white, black, and so you get even numbers, and it's one of my favorite tournaments, I think I talked about it last time, uh, and just a big celebration of chess, because every country is um, represented, and we have almost uh, equal men and women uh, representations, and uh, when I was when I was just starting in chess, the chess Olympiad was taking place in Armenia, and this is one of my biggest inspirations also in chess. All right, so David David Navarra is from Czech Republic, so this is a match of Armenia versus Czech Republic. Levon is playing white, so I'm not going to focus too much on the opening. So Queen's Indian defense, one of the many 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 openings in chess. Why isn't it moving? There's a big fight for the e4 square. White really wants to go e4 and get the perfect center, and black is really not trying to let it happen. So white takes, and instead of taking back, black takes knight c3. So everyone, let's take a few minutes. Uh, and let's think about what to do here with white. Yeah, and, and why the, why we're waiting for their uh, feed to catch up. Um, I, I love spectating the uh, chess Olympiads because uh, there's so many players. And uh, it's it's one of those um, wonderful events because uh, you, you get a uh, disparity in uh, skill levels on board sometimes. And so it's it's very educational to uh, see how uh, strong masters play against um, expert level players. Yeah, it really is. And this is a great opportunity for some grandmasters to really face like top um, top players because, okay, some 2600 gym does not have a chance of playing top 10 player otherwise, mm -hmm. right? But now if you get paired in this tournament, you really get this chance. And it's also great to see the other way around. It's great to see how just how strong this 2700 players are because they just constantly play against each other in a lot of their games, and then the draw, and everyone is like, oh, this is so boring. And then you see, like, Wesley saw he scored, like, 8.5 out of 10. Like, that's so many points. That's so many mm -hmm. wins. Uh, and, you know, he just beats everyone who's, like, 2650 or something. And he's just, you know, like, then you see, I'm like, wow, this is such a strong player. Because 2650 rated chess player is very, very strong. And then you see someone like Wesley who just beats them like there's nothing. And you just really see this uh, their true strength. 
Okay, I'm typing who is playing in this game. Uh, Navarra is with one R. That was a typo by me. Uh, so this is one of the examples when someone asked me, like, when calculating what should I do, and like I told you already, you want to pause and you want to think of your options. And it's very easy to go down a narrow path. Like when your opponent captures, you immediately think, and you have to capture back. And this is how our thinking, um, like this is how we miss things. Like we miss uh, intermediate moves, we make blunders, and bad things happen. So there's some options. Uh, so I, I'm not sure how easy it is to spot this move, but let's at least uh, try to see if we'll spot it. A lot of suggestions being typed in. Remember, uh, Tatev really appreciates uh, um, typing when you guys uh, send her more than just one move. Because uh, sometimes you can be uh, right for the wrong reason. Yeah, so when you look at this position, one thing you want to see is you want to see the tension on this diagonal. Of course, you cannot take because G2 hangs. Mm -hmm. But also keep in mind, if you ever take on B7, you're also getting a rook. So if you could take on E6 with a tempo, then you would take on B7. So yeah, he did play Knight F7 in this position, which is a pretty incredible move. Um, so maybe if we check with modern engines, so this game is from 2006, so okay, the engines have improved a lot. Uh, the evaluation um, can change. Maybe knight f7 is not the best, but we can also take on c3. And the thing is, because this pawn is hanging, black cannot take back this way. So they have to take back with a bishop. And now you can go e4. Okay, maybe we can exchange everything. And because you're, you know, you're playing white, you're ahead in development, and uh, black is going to have some weaknesses. You do have a very nice knight on e5. But this knight on e5 is actually very, it's a pretty piece, but it's also very good, right? It's a centralized knight. Uh, so we can also play this way. This is a very reasonable way of playing. Black will have to go queen d5, and now we're forced to exchange because of this diagonal. This is an option. But yeah, knight f7 is uh, just a spectacular move. I think it's one kind of move that when you see it becomes very difficult not to play mm -hmm. it. Okay, so in the game, uh, I believe queen c8 is the correct move, but he played queen d7. Uh, so Levon took on c3, so let's see what is wrong if I take here. What's wrong with this move? Go ahead and type in what what is wrong with uh, um, threatening the queen and uh, discovered attacking the uh, bishop on b7. What's the what's the downside? It looks it looks good at first glance. Yeah, it looks like everything is hanging right. Okay, what is wrong with d takes e6? That is the question. So, try, um, like, type it. Uh, don't just tell me move. Like, try, like, explain, like, um, why is Black's answer good? Right, so when you take on e6, you're threatening me. Yep, and that changes everything. It's kind everything. of backwards, right? And if you look at the positions, like more, most pieces are under attack, and the problem is if you take back here and I take on g2, now your rook is hanging. And if you move your rook, um, you know, I, I can come back with the bishop and then also get your knight. So you just kind of lost everything. Uh, so instead, Levon takes. 
And the problem is you cannot take on f7, right? Because I take here and it's a discovery on your bishop. And as I mentioned, once I get your bishop, I'm also getting your rook. So you do not want to lose that guy. So instead he took on d5, thinking that if you take on h8, I will take your bishop. Uh, and the problem is this knight is mine. Like I can, this knight I can come back, take with the king. I can play g, uh, g6. Remember, this knight, like they don't get out. They just get stuck. So I can move my bishop back, I will come take your knight, and I will have two pieces for uh, a rook, and I'll be very happy as black. Uh, so for this reason, he takes. And again, thinking is the same, right? Uh, I'm attacking your rook, and I'm attacking your knight. So white to move, what to do? Levon Aronian is such a, a fun fun player to uh, to watch and just a, a really nice person too. Yeah, he's definitely entertaining. He's a great interview. He has a lot of insight. He's also very um, you know he's very sophisticated. He's not just chess player. He's other interests, so it's very interesting to speak to. Very nice e4. So intersecting this and. Um, now the rook on h8 is just yours. So David took. And I have to say his opponent, David Navarra, is also like the nicest person ever. Like, the, like he has a reputation of being one of the nicest guys in chess. He'll learn how to say hello in every language and go out of his way to say hello to you in your language. Wow. Just to you know, make it feel yeah. good. Yeah, he's, he's super nice. Knight c6. Castle. Uh, so it's actually funny here, black played king e7 to trap this knight, because you cannot castle. My knight is going to run away. So you actually have to make sure my knight does not run away. And white simply centralizes the pieces. And, okay, you got the piece back, you got some material back, but I'm still ahead as white. And, again, your problem piece is this. Black defense. Uh, so if you play something like h6, you're kind of welcoming my queen, and now you have to think about uh, all kinds of sacrifices in the future. Instead he goes g6, and whenever you see a move like g6, a move like h4, h5, because g6 creates a hook, so you want to attack it and you want to target it. And once my pawn reaches h5, uh, black is going to have an unpleasant decision. You either have to take and make h7 weak, or you have to let me take on g6. Maybe I don't have h5 right away. Because the queen might take, but, you know, it's something to keep in mind. So he goes h5, and David took on d4, so let's figure out what is wrong with queen h5. So what is wrong with queen h5? And why, while we're waiting for them to uh, type in their answers... Um, it was where? Where was that website again? It, um, uh, what, what? What was the website for the uh, school again? Was it a chess a chess academy dot org? Mm -hmm. You can just email us. Wait, why can I send it? Oh, it's like a message every 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last time you were on here, I got a little motion sick with how fast the, uh, trying to read the, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. AHS, yeah. Yeah, D5, D5, you guys are right, because you're attacking this, you're attacking this, and, um, it's kind of hard to find defense here for black, because if you go here, I'm checkmating you. Which is not hard to imagine, right? Because your position was like barely hanging mm -hmm. on. Okay, so instead, David took on d4. So Levon takes. Knight e5. And okay, there's maybe a million ways of winning. But let's see what you guys would play to end the game. So this was a miniature 20, 25 minutes, 25 minutes, 25 move game. Let's see what you guys come up with. Maybe I can find the result of this match.
Oh, there we go. Go ahead and type in uh, the best line you can think of for white. Uh, so this is against Czech Republic. Where is it? I don't see it. Oh, here. Oh, Armenia beat Czech Republic 3 to 1. So Levon Aronian and Karen Asarian won their games with white, and everyone else drew. Uh, if you go queen g7, remember, I can also run up. I don't have to go to d8 and get made it. This should be four I would not recommend as much. But again, you have a lot of winning moves here. Do keep in mind, I am not going to play the worst move. If you check me, I will block. And this is one thing to... Remember, running away is like the last option, right? It's capture, block, run away. Rook F7 also would not recommend just because we're winning. Doesn't mean, you know, every move is a good <laughs> one. We cannot blunder. Always possible to blunder. Queen G7. Uh, queen G7 is possible, but after I go King D6, your queen will hang. So make Queen, D queen G7 a better move. What is an alter alternative to queen g7? Let me see if someone has said it. This is a good one. Oh, we got on. a lot of people in this room, and uh, you've 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 stumped them. Uh, the thing is, there's so many good moves in this position, but you know, one of them just wins everything. Yeah, queen f6 just wins everything because if you go back, it's just mate. So you have to go forward, and now you simply take, and you win the queen, and you're just going to be up a full queen. Like, black doesn't even have um, a pawn for it, because the pawns are equal. So easy once you see it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the thing, is uh, so many ways to win. So if you go queen g7, and then your opponent goes up, I uh, can I do this? No, I wanted to take on d7. But even here, you can take. Okay, now you only win a piece. But here, queen f6. And how do we come up with queen f6? You look at the position. Think about what's under attack. Okay, my queen is under attack. I want to take on d4. So I want to move my queen in a way that um, it's not going to... to Like, after my opponent moves, my queen will be safe. And also, we have to realize there's this knight f3 check. So it's possible to do this and take. But now you're running into all kinds of... Uh, now we oh, have to start thinking. And this yeah. is what I was telling you in the beginning, right? Once you think you're about to end the game and you're about to play a move that is going to guarantee you the win, take some time, really look over every legal move and make sure you didn't blunder anything. So, for example, if I reach this position in my mind, I would just look be like, okay, the queen cannot move, king moves don't matter, the knight cannot check me, pawn moves don't change the position, I'm, a, I'm threatening the queen with a check, so no rook move can do anything. I'll be like, okay, this works. So you do want to like really check everything because once you play this, the game is over. You go like something like this. Like you allow this, your game is starting all over again. So now you have to play this position all over again and who knows if you're going to win this or not. But if you take like three extra more minutes and you play a winning move, then you're just done. So I think that's it for Great. us. Great, Tatev. So I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, game. You know, uh, I know you said you feel uh, a little um, awkward sometimes when people tell you how inspirational you are, but this was this was really inspirational. I, I loved I loved especially this uh, second position. Um, so th thank you, thank you so much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen who are watching, I hope you you check out uh, Tatev's uh, Twitch stream and. Uh, um, check out uh, the uh, ahsacademy.org and uh, see when she's doing her online classes there. 
maybe uh, consider signing up for one of her classes because uh, obviously now now you see what she she brings to the table it's just in, incredible it's it's educational and uh, and um, entertainment simultaneously so uh, um, th thank you so much Tatev oh thanks for having me and I hope everyone enjoyed it we, we absolutely did bye bye and I will see everybody tomorrow at the uh, free winter chess break camp. Same time, this channel, 11 a.m. Pacific time.